for a moment that the famous German technology would fail. I don't want that to happen. <laughs> it's what always happens at MIT. <laughs> Well, the question, what is special about language, uh, covers far too much ground for me to try to address it uh, more than very superficially. I'll have to cut lots of interesting corners. Uh, I'd like to concentrate on two approaches to the question, which differ radically in assumptions. Uh, since the time is brief, I'll have to draw the lines too sharply, but uh, not too much to identify some uh, issues that are worth thinking about, uh, I hope. Uh, the two approaches uh, differ on whether the announced topic uh, makes any sense in the first place. It's based, the topic is based on several presuppositions. Uh, one of them is that language exists that is, exists as a, uh, an independent object of serious study, and not just an arbitrary collection of uh, various phenomena and processes, as something like, say, today's weather, uh, which is, uh, there's no science of today's weather. Uh, that language exists in a serious sense. It might seem uncontentious, but it's very far from that. In fact, a major tendency in contemporary cognitive science, possibly the dominant one, uh, holds that it does not exist and sometimes uh, states that uh, forcefully and explicitly. It should be recalled that there's nothing new in this stance. If you go back about half a century, uh, it was widely held by the most uh, prominent uh, philosophers uh, linguists and others, that language is just a matter of uh, elementary psychological processes and some notion of induction or analogy that was left quite obscure. And so, for example, for um, W.V. Quine at Harvard, the most influential philosopher, I suppose, in the world concerned with the general issues, uh, for him, a language is just, I'm quoting him, a fabric of sentences associated with one another and with stimuli by the mechanism of conditioned response, and a rather arbitrary fabric uh, depending on the accidental course of conditioning, which will differ from one person to another. Uh, in professional linguistics, a dominant view at the time was that uh, languages can differ without limits, apart from very restricted constraints, maybe some uh, phonetic processes. Incidentally, it was the same, pretty much the same view was held in biology at the time about organisms. It was assumed that they could differ essentially in arbitrary ways, uh, depending on the accidental course of natural selection. Uh, the, uh, it was also uh, widely assumed in linguistics that linguistic theory consists of nothing more than a collection of uh, procedures, procedures of analysis, uh, to reduce a body of data, a corpus so-called, uh, to an organized form in one or another way, depending on one's particular purposes. Uh, later, later versions of the non-existence hypothesis uh, uh, within philosophy were that rules of language, any mental rules, can be, are, can be postulated uh, only if they are in principle accessible to introspection. That's a dogma with a long history, uh, in, incoherent in my opinion, when looked at carefully, but uh, even if it's uh, accepted, if you adopt it, uh, it excludes almost everything. And there are other variants, uh, among them the assist insistence, again by prominent philosophers, uh, that uh, language must be regarded as a, a socio-political entity of some kind, uh, hence dependent on continuity of empires, uh, colors on maps, uh, literary culture, uh, national myths, military forces, and so on. But in any event, nothing that exists that can be studied.
a, a corollary in the mid-20th century, and in fact since, is that there are no real problems to solve in the study of language, apart from accumulation and organization of data. Uh, something like what uh, Wittgenstein called uh, an assembly of particulars. Uh, with the computer age coming into focus and back about in the 1950s, uh, many leading figures held that since the only real object is some kind of a corpus of data, uh, automa automation of generally uh, accepted procedures and statistical analysis of data should yield everything relevant about the language. Uh, well, the announced topic today uh, presupposes the existence of language, but it also presupposes the existence of other cognitive facilities. Uh, so it uh, essentially takes the mind to be much like the rest of the organism, a complex of subsystems, often informally called organs, more technically modules, uh, each with enough internal integrity so that it makes good sense to study each in abstraction from the others with which it's integrated in the life of the organism. For example, the uh, visual, uh, immune, digestive, uh, uh, other organs uh, below the neck, metaphorically speaking, and the various mental organs, uh, language, planning, uh, the various structures of memory, uh, and uh, organization of action, and so on, uh, whatever the right analysis of the mind turns out to be. Uh, the cognitive neuroscientist uh, Randy Gallistel at Rutgers has observed that the uh, biological norm is modular systems with special uh, growth learning mechanisms in different domains uh, and in different species. And there's every reason, I think, to expect human language to keep to the biological norm in this respect. In fact, very strong reason, because there are the crucial features of human language that appear to be quite isolated in the biological world. And they also seem to have emerged very recently in evolutionary time, uh, many millions of years after the separation of modern humans from any other surviving species. Well, my own assumption is that language does exist as a module of the mind-body, mostly the brain, uh, but that the non-existence approach uh, is in part raising the right questions, though pursuing them in a way that's very likely to fail, at least as failure and success have been understood uh, in the sciences for many centuries. The study of evolution of language is a very lively topic these days, uh, judging by the number of publications that pour out with such titles. And that's rather odd in many respects. Uh, much simpler questions are scarcely investigated. Uh, the evolution of uh, the communication systems of um, hundreds of bee species, for example, is plainly a far simpler question, but it's recognized by bee scientists to be uh, much too hard to say much about. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, very little is known about evolution of cognition altogether. Uh, and it's quite possible that nothing much can be learned, at least by any methods that are currently understood. Uh, that's a conclusion that's been argued by uh, a very prestigious evolutionary biologist, uh, Richard Lewontin, in well-known but unfortunately uh, neglected essays. Uh, a look at the literature on evolution of language reveals that most of it scarcely, ev scarcely even addresses the topic. Instead, it offers speculations about the evolution of communication, which is a very different matter. It's also based on very strange beliefs about evolution, uh, to some of which I'll briefly return. Well, to make the discussion concrete, uh, let me illustrate with a recent essay uh, that encapsulates quite clearly the main assumptions of the uh, contemporary non-existence approach to language and its evolution. Uh, 
It's in uh, Science Magazine, the Science Journal of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, it's a review article uh, discussing several books on evolution of language by uh, N.J. Enfield of the Max Planck Institute. Uh, he finds essentially nothing of any value in the books that are reviewed. Uh, their contents, he argues, is uh, lethally tainted by the existence assumption. That is the belief that there are uh, rule systems that determine form meaning relations in language and the conditions of language use. Uh, to illustrate the fallacy of the existence approach, uh, the article is accompanied by a photograph of three infants, um, suitably multiracial, uh, apparently noticing each other. Uh, the caption reads, communication without syntax. And the point is to show that real syst rule systems of the kind that are studied under the existence assumption are not necessary for communication. Actually, a picture of three bacteria could have made the same point. Uh, the title of this article, Enfield's article, is Without Social Context, with a question mark. The question mark expresses the surprise uh, at a basic fallacy of the existence approach. It ignores social context when it seeks to discover the properties of language. So just, again, to try to make the matter concrete, uh, take one sentence, uh, the sentence, he wondered whether the mechanics fixed the cars, simple sentence, and consider two questions that you can ask about it. Uh, how many cars, how many mechanics? So the two interrogative expressions are, uh, how many cars did he wonder whether the mechanics fixed? Uh, answer, three cars. Uh, how many mechanics did he wonder whether fixed the cars? Answer, three mechanics. Well, the two sentences very clearly differ in status. You can't ask how many mechanics did he wonder if fixed the cars. Now, that's called an island violation. Technically, it's called an ECP violation. Uh, we can think the thought, find thought, but to express the thought requires some more complex paraphrase. Well, to investigate questions like these, and there are innumerable similar ones, uh, according to uh, Enfield and the editors of Science, uh, we have to consider the social context of actual normal use of these expressions. Uh, that inquiry is very quickly finished. Uh, there's effectively none. Uh, and it's a mistake to raise the question in the first place, according to this approach, because the sentences are constructed as an experiment and not drawn from a massive corpus of observed data where you'd never find sentences like that. Now, that is, the inquiry proceeds by uh, the methods of the sciences since antiquity, which is considered a serious flaw. The observation about social context is uncontroversial with regard to communication. And surely the study of communication must take into account social context. It's also uncontroversial that the study of the mechanisms that we put to use that typically ignore social context in all domains, and quite rightly so. For example, the classical work on uh, neurophysiology of vision or on uh, object recognition and constancy, or uh, Shimon Ullman's very interesting study of how uh, minimal stimuli, practically none, are interpreted reflexively as rigid objects in motion, or in fact virtually all the fundamental work that aims to determine uh, the properties of the modules of cognition at whatever level of inquiry the uh, the study is conducted, uh, physiological to uh, um, psychological. But we're instructed by this approach that the study of the mechanisms involved in the examples that I mentioned, or um, vowel harmony in Turkish, or relative scope of operators, or in fact everything else about language, must depart from the scientific norm. Uh, the kind of critique that I just outlined, which is quite widespread, 
is generally accompanied by a novel concept of science that has emerged in the cognitive sciences, contemporary cognitive sciences, and related areas of linguistics, uh, which has a new notion of success. Uh, an account of phenomena is taken to be successful to the extent that it approximates unanalyzed data. So take, say, the study of uh, communication of bees. Uh, according to this conception, the way it's generally conducted by scientists is seriously flawed. Uh, instead of difficult experiments, uh, devising circumstances that never occur in nature, like, say, uh, having bees fly to flowers in an island and a lake to test whether they're using an odor trail. Instead of doing things like that, and many more complicated ones, uh, bee scientists should be carrying out statistical analysis of uh, uh, massive collections of videotapes of bees swarming. Uh, they would achieve greater and greater success in approximating the videotapes, and they get a tolerably good prediction of what's likely to happen next. Uh, actually, a much better science pr approximation than bee scientists could give or would care about. And in fact, you might uh, revise physics the same way. So throw out the physics department for the last couple hundred years. Uh, no balls rolling down frictionless planes, which can't exist in nature, and other such uh, abstractions and idealizations that have defined the subject for centuries. Rather, what you do is extensive statistical analysis of uh, videotapes of uh, whatever's happening outside the window, say leaves blowing in the wind, and other natural events. And that'll surely give more uh, successful predictions of what will happen next outside the window than what the physics department can provide. Now, if you look at the major cognitive science journals, and also general journals like Science or Nature, now they regularly publish articles that are that triumphantly list dramatic failures, which are called successes. Uh, and they are successes in terms of this new concept, which is unique in the history of science and also radically restricted uh, to language, in fact, uh, because it, the idea is so obviously absurd when you move beyond. Uh, in fact, uh, even to very cl closely related systems like, say, arithmetic, uh, you don't study a person's arithmetical capacity by constructing models based on statistical analysis of masses of observations uh, of what, when, what happens when people try to multiply numbers in their heads without external memory. Uh, at least, I hope nobody does. Uh, Enfield also um, puts forth a far-reaching thesis, it's quite standard in the cognitive sciences, and a very clear expression of the non-existence thesis it is that language is entirely grounded in a constellation of cognitive capacities that each, taken separately, has other functions as well, which means that language exists only in the sense that today's weather exists. Uh, it's a, a constellation of many factors that operate independently. The examples I mentioned, the ECP examples, uh, would have to be like that somehow. Actually, he cites a source to justify the conclusion, but it has almost no relation to the thesis. And it's not because he's chosen badly, but because there are none that do any better. But he's correct in saying that this is what many, probably most, cognitive sciences believe. Uh, he presents a closely related thesis that is also very widely held, namely, there are well-developed gradualist evolutionary arguments to support the conclusion that there's no thing, such thing as language except as a complex, kind of arbitrary complex of uh, independent cognitive processes. Again, no relevant sources cited, nor does one exist. Uh, these gradualist evolutionary claims, which are often held to be some kind of necessity, uh, he presents in critique of what he calls the saltationist argument, sudden jump argument, namely that the transition from finite to unbounded 
was not gradualist. That's a strange but very standard position. It's a logical truth that the transition was saltationist. You can't get to unbounded from, by small steps from finite. That's just a logical truth. Uh, but saltationist is uh, a dirty word in many uh, circles on the basis of a curious but widespread misunderstanding of evolutionary biology. Perhaps worth exploring, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll put it aside except from noting that the saltationist approach, heresy, if you like, is uh, totally unproblematic unproble among evolutionary biologists. So for example, one recent book by two prominent evolutionary biologists that takes as its central problem, I'm quoting, the question, how can small random genetic changes be converted into complex, useful innovations? Gives many examples. Uh, a leading paleoanthropologist concludes that the innovation that set the stage for language, language acquisition depended on the phenomenon of emergence, whereby a chance combination of pre-existing elements results in something totally unexpected, a sudden emergent event, presumably a neural change in some population of the human lineage, rather minor in genetic terms, which probably had nothing whatsoever to do with adaptation. All quotes. Now, this is all saltationism with a vengeance, at least if the term is supposed to have any meaning. Well, although we know very little about evolution of language, there are a few fairly clear conclusions, and they're suggested. Uh, there's very good evidence that the language capacity is the same for all human groups. So for example, if an infant from a remote tribe in the uh, Amazon jungle is raised in Boston, its language will be that of my grandchildren, and conversely. Now, there are individual differences, uh, but no known group differences. Uh, it follows that there has been no meaningful evolutionary change with regard to language since the time when our common ancestors uh, left Africa. Uh, they're assumed to be a very small group, uh, spread around the world very quickly. Uh, perhaps about 50,000 years ago, it's generally surmised. If you go back roughly 50,000 years before that, there's no evidence in the archeological record that language existed at all. So somewhere in that quite narrow window, which is a blink of the eye in evolutionary terms, uh, there seems to have been a sudden explosion of uh, creative activity, uh, complex social organization, a symbolic behavior of various kinds, uh, records of astronomical events, a complex social organization. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, Jared Diamond, biologist, called it a great leap forward. It's generally assumed by paleoanthropologists to be associated with the emergence of language right in that window. And since then, there appears to have been no evolutionary change. If one prefers to double or triple the numbers, uh, nothing relevant changes. Uh, these are quite simple observations. They're reasonably well supported, and they provide some plausible suggestions about the design of language, which I'll return to briefly. Well, suppose now that we do assume that language exists as an object of study, and we want to look at language as a normal biological system, a module of the mind-body, alongside of many others. Then the standard questions uh, arise uh, for any biological system, uh, roughly uh, what, uh, how, and why questions. So what are the properties of the acquired languages, each considered now an internal system of an individual? Uh, how are they acquired? And why do they have these properties and not other properties? Uh, well, perhaps the most elementary property of language, and one which distinguishes it from anything else known in the biological world, uh, is that it consists of a discrete infinity of interpretable expressions kind of like the natural numbers. So there's a five word sentence, a six word sentence, but no five and a half word sentence, and it goes on indefinitely. Uh, that means that each 
speaker has internalized a what's called a generative process that yields an infinite array of hierarchically structured expressions uh, which are interpreted uh, at the interfaces to two other systems, the sensory motor system and what's called the conceptual intentional system, basically thought and planning of action. Uh, the unbounded range is a very elementary fact which rather interestingly seems to have received little notice, maybe none, until the 17th century scientific revolution where it, uh, it's discussed by Galileo, much more extensively by Descartes, and it played a significant role. Uh, any approach to language that doesn't at least capture this property just can't be taken seriously. Uh, for language or any other internal module, the growth and development in the individual involves at least three factors. The one factor is external data. The second factor is a genetic endowment that uh, converts data to experience and it guides the general course of development. And third, uh, principles of broader scope, uh, some of them probably laws of nature, which are invariably a major factor in evolution and development. Well, for language, you can analyze the genetic endowment into two factors, two parts. Uh, there's a component that's specific to human language. Now, that's called universal grammar. It's a modern adaptation of a traditional term, which meant something else, UG for short, it's called. And then there are others that are just relevant to language development, other cognitive systems and neurophysiological structures and so on. It would seem likely, prima facie, that UG is critically involved in determining such phenomena as the ones uh, I mentioned. Uh, although third factor general principles uh, uh, probably are also crucial. Uh, but we can explore the role of UG uh, in the very early stages, early moments of language development. So it's now known, uh, for example, that newborn infants uh, can instantly and reflexively extricate language relevant data from the confusion, the famous blooming buzzing confusion around them. That's no trivial task. It's apparently a human specific element of UG, impossible for any other organism. Uh, and the infant also very quickly acquires knowledge of the general, it's called prosodic system of the language, the pitch and stress contours, which differ from language to language. But by a couple of months, the child has mastered them. And in fact, it seems that in part, this is prenatal uh, intrauterine learning because it's all there at the moment of birth, as you can tell by sophisticated experiments. Uh, uh, the, and the sound system generally is, is known quite quickly in a few months and maybe a lot more. Uh, all of this is, must be dependent on UG. There are some early steps which do involve other cognitive processes. So in my own work on this topic in the 1950s, I took for granted that uh, extraction of words from running text discourse uh, has to be based on calculation of transitional probabilities, since there seemed to be no other relevant evidence. But the matter turns out to be more complex and much more interesting. The very recent work shows that this method fails, uh, though the results improve sharply when the method interacts with uh, UG principles. So six-month-old infants uh, segment running discourse into elements that have word-like properties uh, they, uh, when high transition probabilities, which uh, are aligned with phrasal uh, prosodic constituents, which actually are syntax related. Uh, and this is all determined by subtle, unconscious, and reflexive pro processes, but Whatever it is, it's there by about six months. Uh, although uh, 
real results remain sparse. The role of statistics and uh, statistical reasoning and other cognitive processes in language acquisition is potentially a significant area of research. It's something that's never been in doubt. Uh, there are also are presumably conditions imposed on language by the structure of the brain, although too little is understood about this to draw any conclusions, although there has been recent progress in neurolinguistics, but not at this level of fine detail. Uh, it may be, as uh, again, cognitive neuroscientist Randy Scalistle has argued, that a fundamental reorientation of centuries of study of the brain will be necessary to discover the neural elements that enter into the computational capacities, uh, not only of human language, but even of insects, where they're indeed astonishing. Uh, as a recent book on this. The uh, study of uh, the neural basis for language uh, raises very special difficulties well above others, precisely because language is so special. So for example, a lot is known about the neural structure of uh, the human visual system. Uh, but uh, that's learned not from the study of humans. It's studied by invasive experimentation with uh, uh, cats and monkeys. Uh, rightly or wrongly, we allow ourselves to torture them. Uh, and, from, and they have about the same visual systems as humans. The mammalian visual system seems pretty common. Uh, so by studying them with invasive experimentation, you do learn something about the human visual system. Uh, but there's no way to carry out invasive experimentation with other organisms in the case of language because there's nothing analogous anywhere in the biological world. So no experimentation is possible. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's turn to UG, universal grammar. The question whether language exists is basically the question whether UG exists. As I've mentioned, this is commonly denied, but I don't know of any coherent alternative. Uh, in the early work in the 1950s, it appeared as though UG must be extremely rich to achieve a degree of descriptive adequacy. Uh, one major goal of theoretical linguistics since that time has been to reduce the postulated complexity of UG in accounting for the phenomena of language, like the one example I mentioned. But the reasons are perfectly straightforward. Uh, the first is just standard rational inquiry, uh, seeking to achieve greater explanatory depth. And another reason is the hope that there might someday be a serious study of evolution of language. Uh, evidently, this task, to the extent that it's feasible at all, is rendered more difficult to the extent that the postulated target, UG, is more complex. That's obvious. The uh, non-existence approach shares the same goal namely to reduce UG, in fact, to reduce it to zero in this case. But there are several salient differences between these two approaches. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, virtually, that there are, the first has to do with regard to results. I think it's fair to say that there are virtually none, maybe none at all, in the non-existence literature, except in terms of the curious notion of success that I mentioned that's been contrived at departing from all of science. Uh, uh, in contrast, there are quite substantial results in the existence literature. And if you look at them carefully, uh, overwhelmingly, over half a century, they result from investigating third factor considerations of computational complexity, is sometimes called, sometimes the inquiry is phrased in different words, but that's what it comes down to. Uh, for those of you who know the literature, these steps include, among other things, dissolving so-called constructions uh, into uh, uh, more general components, uh, elimination of phrase structure grammars, total elimination with all their rich stipulations, uh, radical reduction of the complexity of transformational uh, grammars, uh, the kind that were designed to account somehow, accommodate non-contiguous relations uh, 
uh, such as the ubiquitous phenomenon of displacement in language and also morphological discontinuity. Uh, and finally, in more recent years, uh, the unification of these two generative systems under the simplest possible computational operation, one which functions in some manner in any computational system, generative system. Uh, recent inquiry into these topics is often called the minim minimalist program, but the term apparently has misled people. It's actually just ordinary science. It extends the main thrust of theoretical linguistics uh, since the early days of the contemporary work in the 1950s. And these developments are rather natural. The language is very clearly a computational system. So it makes good sense to seek the uh, role of general principles of computational efficiency that apply far more broadly and uh, probably are rooted in organism-independent natural law. Uh, this is particularly natural given the very little we know about the evolution of language, what I just mentioned. Uh, clearly a generative system emerged sometime in the very recent past uh, of course, in some individual. That's the way mutations take place. They don't take place in groups. Uh, perhaps some small rewiring of the brain. Well, it should have been as simple as possible. That is the minimal change from the earlier state by some small mutation. Uh, furthermore, there were no selectional pressures at all at that so initial stage. So we would therefore expect this emergent process to be determined solely by natural law, rather like a snowflake should be perfect. Uh, and the same should be true as this change is transmitted to offspring, uh, ultimately maybe dominating a small breeding group. Uh, and there's increasing evidence that something like that may well have been what happened. Uh, well, consider the what questions. As soon as the question was addressed within the framework of generative grammar about 60 years ago, many puzzles came to light, which previously had been unnoticed in the thousands of years of detailed study of language. And some of them are still on the agenda. Uh, that moment is somewhat reminiscent of the er very early modern scientific revolution, 17th century. Uh, for millennia, the scientists had been satisfied with traditional answers to simple questions, like uh, why does a rock fall to the ground and steam rise to the sky? Uh, answer, uh, they're moving to their natural place. End of discussion. Uh, when Galileo and others allowed themselves to be puzzled by such facts as these, and to investigate them, incidentally, very quickly refuting conventional beliefs, science, modern science, began. Science entered a new phase. Now, the capacity to be puzzled by what looks simple is well worth cultivating. History amply reveals that. Well, of the myriad puzzles that arose back in the 50s, when the first efforts were made to go beyond resort to essentially vacuous notions like uh, analogy, training, uh, pattern formation, and so on, all left obscure, uh, of many, a huge number of examples very quickly discovered. I'll just mention two because they're, uh, they are probably the only two cases for which answers have been sought relying on non-linguistic cognitive processes. As I mentioned, there's a very widely held belief, but there's almost no work pursuing it. Uh, there are a couple of cases, though, two in fact. Uh, typically, they adopt the non-existence approach. Well, one very old example has to do with uh, what's called auxiliary inversion. Uh, so, for example, as in the sentence, uh, can eagles that fly swim? Simple sentence. Uh, well, we understand that the question is whether eagles can swim and not whether they can fly. That is, the auxiliary element, can, is associated with swim, not fly. Uh, that's obvious from the interpretation. Uh, it's also obvious from the morphology. Uh, so you can say, uh, are eagles that fly swimming? Have eagles that fly been swimming? 
that you can't say are eagles that are flying swim, meaning in this case that uh, uh, that uh, uh, the, is it the case that the eagles that are flying swim? Not perfectly fine thought, but you just can't say it. Uh, something about the design of language hampers communication, compels a paraphrase in this case, uh, much like the ECP examples that I mentioned, where a perfectly good thought can be, uh, can be held in the mind, but it can't be expressed, except in some roundabout, complex way, as a result of something about language design. Well, uh, this, uh, the question about auxiliary inversion, or uh, anal many analogs show up in languages all over the place. Now, that question had never arisen in millennia of careful study of language. It was taken to be obvious, like objects seeing the, seeking their natural place. But if you think about it, it's not obvious. Now, why should it be the case? In fact, ease of computation would suggest that it should work the other way around. It should suggest that the, the fronted auxiliary, just remember the sentence, can eagles that fly swim, that the front, the can that's in the front, should be associated with the closest verb, hence fly, not swim. Now that's a far easier computational operation than the actual one, which involves imposing a structure on the expression. Now furthermore, communication would be facilitated if both options were available. Now that would avoid the need for the complex paraphrase in one case. So putting the matter differently, there are two concepts of minimal distance which are competing. Uh, uh, one concept is minimal linear distance. How close in the linear order are two things. Now that would relate the sentence to eagles that can fly swim. A minimal structural distance relates it to eagles that fly can swim much more complex computational operation. Reason is that eagles that fly is a phrase, so you get a structural distance giving a different answer than linear distance. And the question then reduces to why the language learner reflexively minimizes the property of structural distance rather than adopting the computationally far simpler property of linear distance or adopting both uh, facilitating communication. Uh, similar uh, problems arise all over the place with different constructions. Well, there's a very good answer to the what question, and namely minimal structural distance reigns unchallenged. It's just something that the infant automatically applies always. But the how and the why questions, uh, they remain. Uh, a very simple and quite likely correct answer one which has lots of implications if it's tr true, it has to do with the general architecture of the language faculty. Uh, there is an old dictum of Aristotle's that language is sound with a meaning, common sense dictum, but it seems it's not quite right, that it should be inverted. Uh, language is meaning with sound. Uh, to put it more precisely, the core of the language faculty appears to be a generative process that yields structured expressions that are interpreted by the thought system, conceptual intentional system, while externalization to the sensory motor system is a secondary process. Uh, linear order or some kind of order is clearly required for externalization. That's a property of the sensory motor system. And of course it varies depending on the sensory modality used for externalization. So it's different for speech and sign. Uh, but it doesn't seem to enter into, uh, at all, into core semantic processes, processes of thought and uh, uh, planning. That just seems to use hierarchy, not order. Uh, so it looks as though linearization is a reflex of the sensory motor system. Well, that's not uncontroversial, a lot of empirical problems, but uh, there's considerable evidence, I think mounting evidence, that it is indeed the case. Uh, actually, there's also some interesting evidence in this case from the neurosciences. There's a research group in Milan uh, which studied uh, brain activity of subjects who are presented with two types of stimuli, in both cases invented sentences, 
in one case, the invented sentences satisfy UG principles, and in the other case, they don't conform to them. A particular example would be, for example, neg negating a sentence by placing the negative element after the third world word uses elementary property of linearization. Well, they found that in the former case, uh, invented s systems using UG principles, there was normal activation in the language areas of the brain, Broca's area. Uh, but when linear order was used, uh, there wasn't activation in Broca's area, just all over the place. In other words, the subjects were treating it as some kind of a puzzle, but not a linguistic problem. Uh, well, that's, uh, this is a difficult but potentially quite rich uh, research area. Actually, the linguist in the group, um, Andrea Moro, is well known to some of you. Uh, well, that conclusion fits very well with the little that we know about evolution uh, and what we know about language much more generally. And if this is correct, we immediately derive answers to the how and the why questions for auxiliary inversion. Uh, linear order is simply not available for the language learner who is guided by a very simple UG principle that determines the general architecture of language relying on the third factor uh, condition of minimal uh, computation. It's probably an overriding principle that the brain operates with altogether. Well, there are broader implications if you think it through. Uh, one consequence is that communication must be a peripheral aspect of language. If externalization altogether is secondary, communication is even more so. And that means that the extensive literature of speculation on language evolution is on the wrong track to start with. One reason why it never gets anywhere. Actually, there's much more substantial evidence for this conclusion, some having to do with evolutionary considerations, uh, but uh, more substantive ones based on fundamental properties of language design. It's, it's slightly technical, but I'll try to keep it simple. Uh, I mentioned before that contiguous and non-contiguous relations in language, which in earlier years were distributed between different parts of the system, phrase structure and transformational, uh, it's now understood that they can be unified under the simplest computational operation possible. They call it merge. It's an operation that's at the core of any computational system. It simply says take two objects that have already been formed and uh, construct a new object from them. Uh, so the, call the two objects X and Y, and f construct Z. Well, the, th the third factor principle of minimal computation uh, has a consequence. It dictates that neither X nor Y can be modified by the operation and uh, that they appear unordered. That's the simplest operation, hence the right one, unless we have counter evidence. And that's a plausible assumption, the lack of order, for the reasons I discussed. Now, that simply means that, uh, so say, suppose neither X nor Y is part of the other. Uh, well, then merge just yields the set containing X and Y. Okay, no order, uh, no change. Let's call that external merge. Well, suppose that one is part of the other. That's the other possible case. Uh, say y is part of x. And then if you think it through, the result of merge is again a set, but it's the set containing y and the set xy. Now that's going to have two copies of y, one outside xy, one inside. I call that internal merge. And notice that both of these operations come free. Uh, it would require some stipulation to bar either one of them. So if we're working with the simplest possible system, they're both there automatically. But internal merge, if you think about it, yields displacement, non-contiguous relation. In fact, it turns out to yield displacement in a form that's appropriate for the thought system, for the CI system. So say, take a simple sentence, which books did John read, or its analog in other languages. Here, the phrase, which books, has two semantic roles. 
uh, it receives its role as the object of read, just as in the case of read books. And it's also an interrogative operator, which technically terms binds the variable uh, that's in the object position, so that the interpretation is something like uh, for which books X, John read books X. Now notice that that can be read off directly from the generated structure, which books did John read which books, which is automatically the, pro uh, the product of internal merge with no further comment. So in this and innumerable, much more complex cases, uh, internal merge gives the forms directly, which are what you need for semantic interpretation for the conceptual intentional system for thought. Uh, that, uh, however, notice that these are the wrong structures for the sensory motor system. The universally in language, only the structurally prominent copy is pronounced. There's actually an interesting class of exceptions which support the generalization if you look at them closely. Well, that follows from another principle of minimal computation, namely pronounce as little as possible, which is a huge saving of effort if you look at what goes on in the brain. Well, the result is that the articulated sentences have gaps. Which books did you read? There's something missing, a gap. And as is well known to anyone who has uh, worked on perception of language or parsing of language, uh, that yields very difficult problems of interpretation. You know, So-called filler gap problems are the main problems in developing parsing programs. Uh, if everything was pronounced, you, you wouldn't have those problems. You know what's there. Uh, but minimal computation uh, forces uh, a, in, a lack of uh, communicative problems. Uh, well, uh, the conclusion appears to be that uh, if language is perfectly designed, if it became something like a snowflake when it suddenly emerged, maybe 60, 70,000 years ago, but then it's gonna provide structures with the right semantic interpretations, but difficulties for communication. Now that's pretty well established. There are many such cases. So amb ambiguous sentences, so-called garden path sentences, where you start interpreting them, but it's the wrong way because total structure has something else. Um, so-called island constructions like ECP and others. In general, where we understand these at all, it appears that these structures follow, they result from free, unconstrained functioning of the simplest rules, minimizing computation, but they yield difficulties for communication. Well, that's just scratching the surface, but perhaps it's enough to suggest the kind of arguments that appear to provide pretty strong support for the conclusion that language is meaning with sound inverts Aristotle's dictum, and that externalization and a fortiori communication are secondary aspects, in the case of communication, ter tertiary aspects of language use. Uh, well, aux inversion has been the topic of quite a considerable industry in computational cognitive science, is seeking to show that the child acquires this knowledge on the basis of a statistical analysis of a corpus of data in accord with the non-existence thesis. And new papers appear regularly in the scientific journals up to the last few weeks, in fact. Now, they have very curious properties. One is that each one fails dramatically by the criteria of science, uh, but they're all hailed as successes in the literature, as in fact they sometimes are in accord with the novel conception of success mentioned earlier, rough, roughly approximating unanalyzed data. Uh, another curious property is that each approach uh, ignores the simple explanation, which in fact generalizes to many other constructions in all languages, structural distances minimized. A third curious property is that it wouldn't matter if the approaches succeeded, because they'd leave the basic questions untouched. Namely, why is structural rather than linear distance minimized universally in all languages and all constructions in which the question arises? Now, for, for the most part, these methods, statistical analysis, would work, or very similar ones, would work just as well in a pseudo-language 
that used linear distance uh, rather than structural distance for interpretation in such cases as, say, can eagles that fly swim? And that raises a background question, which these approaches don't raise. How does the child know the intended interpretation? Uh, unless it's already relying on the minimal structural distance principle without any data at all. Uh, so the proposals, the big literature, just don't, they make no sense at all. But it's the main example in computational cognitive science and the study of language. Well, another, there's one other case that's discussed in the non-existence literature worth looking at, has to do with what's called binding theory the relation between a term and a, a term that uh, basically has the same reference. Uh, so for example, take the sentence, do they expect John to see each other next week? Well, that sentence is sharply is a deviant. There's no antecedent for each other. But if you delete John, you get, do they expect to see each other uh, next week? That's fine. Uh, they is the antecedent of each other. Uh, this is one of the rare cases of any significance that is discussed in the non-existence literature, a recent paper, in fact. Two co cognitive scientists argue that uh, the relation between they and each other is, I'm quoting, is simply an instance of a general cognitive tendency to resolve ambiguities rapidly in linguistic and perceptual input specifically to establish the antecedent anaphor relation, the they each other relation, as quickly as possible in comprehension. So the facts might rely on an innate constraint, but not one that's part of UG. Well, the claim as formulated is instantly refuted by the simple example I mentioned. So if John is present in the sentence, do they expect John to see each other? then the quickest way to resolve the interpretation is to take they to be the antecedent, since John can't be. Well, even if there's some way around this problem, uh, the proposal fails even if John doesn't appear. So take the sentence, who do they expect to see each other next week? Well, uh, the closest antecedent is they, but that's not the way you interpret it. Uh, 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 it's intuitively clear that uh, what it means is uh, which is the person X, the thing X, such that they expect to see X, uh, uh, that they expect X to see each other, not John, not they. That's obvious from the interpretation. Uh, well, the reason for all this is intuitively clear. The ear doesn't hear an antecedent for each other closer to it than they. But the mind perceives it, uh, namely it perceives it in the interpretation for which book X they expect the person X to see each other next week. So you get X being the each, antecedent of each other even though it isn't there. And uh, if you think about it for a minute, you'll see that this arises from internal merge, much like the example, which books did John read? Uh, in brief, uh, as soon as you pay attention to the most elementary facts, it appears that you just have to reintroduce rule systems of the kind that the authors are trying to avoid and much else if you go beyond these. Well, despite the widespread and often quite enthusiastic endorsement, it's hard to find evidence or argument to support the non-existence approaches. On the contrary, there's quite good reason to believe that language does exist as a module of the mind alongside of others, and that this meeting has a topic. Uh, the way to pursue the topic would be to discover the specific properties of each of these modules and the ways in which they interact. Well, that effort quickly becomes more technical than I can talk about here, uh, but when I think you find when you pursue it, there's quite a lot to say about the design of language along the lines I briefly mentioned, and also some other cognitive systems. So for example, the navigational systems of insects, or mammalian visual perception, and organization of action, a few others. But the word and in the title remains elusive. Uh, not a great deal is known about how these systems interact or even compare.
Well, I don't want to end without mentioning, at least mentioning, another serious problem which has also been ignored. Uh, a computational procedure uh, requires certain atoms of computation, smallest pieces. So for language, something like a le lexicon of minimal elements. But even the simplest of these pose fundamental problems fundamental puzzles. How do, they relate, how do they relate to the mind external world? Well, there's two aspects to this problem, meaning and sound. The latter is secondary, if the reason I reviewed proves to be accurate. Uh, for sound, uh, we at least know where to look. The answers lie in articulatory and acoustic phonetics. Problems are difficult. They've been studied intensively for 60 years with high-tech equipment uh, gives some answers, but leaves many unresolved. Uh, what about meaning? Well, there's a standard answer in this case. The standard answer is provided by uh, referentialist doctrine. Uh, the word cow it picks out cows. It may be a causal relation, standard argument in philosophy and cognitive science and linguistics. Uh, something like that does seem to be true for animal communication. So in, take a look at the symbols in animal communication. They seem to have that property. They seem invariably to relate to some physically identifiable external symbol or internal state. So say a vervet monkey that has a warning cry that comes out reflexively when leaves are moving in a certain way. And maybe it means a predator's coming or something that means I'm hungry. You know, it can relate to a state that can be identified by a physicist, a natural scientist, uh, externally or internally. However, nothing like, re even remotely like that seems to be true for the simplest elements of human language. You know, cow, river, person, tree, pick anyone you want. I won't have time to go into it, but uh, it, think about it for a few minutes, you see it's just totally false. Well, there are inklings of that understanding in Aristotle and his discussion of what he called matter and form, but it was considerably enriched uh, during the first cognitive revolution of the 17th century, the early scientific revolution, uh, mainly in the work of uh, the British Neoplatonists and the classical empiricists. They recognized that the elementary elements of language and of thought are not directly linked to mind independent external entities. In other words, there's no notion of reference in human language and thought. There's an action of referring, but that's a very different matter. Now, rather, the basic elements provide rich perspectives for interpreting the mind independent world that involves Gestalt properties, uh, cause and effect, what's called sympathy of parts, the way things hang together, uh, concerns directed to a common end, uh, psychic continuity, and all and other uh, mentally imposed properties. Actually, what happened, that what was happening roughly in that period is that Aristotle's conception of matter and form were separated. Uh, physics kept to matter. It, uh, eliminated form, you know, design, purpose, and so on. But with a cognitive revolution, form came back, namely as part of our cognitive processes for interpreting events. And that seems to be a core property. Well, in this respect, the meaning turns out to be rather similar to sound. So every act of articulating some item, say the internal syllable, ta, simplest syllable, Every act of articulating it yields a physical event, but nobody seeks some category of physical events associated with the internal syllable. Wouldn't make any sense. Uh, similarly, some, by no means all, of the uses of the word cow or river or person, uh, some of them refer to physically identifiable entities, but there's no category of such entities that's identifiable even in principle by a natural scientist investigating the mind external world. And that was understood. So by the time of, say, David Hume, uh, summarizing a century of inquiry, 
Uh, he said, don't quote him, that the identity that we ascribe to vegetables, animal bodies, artifacts, persons in their minds, and so on, that is the array of individuating properties, pick them out, he said is only a fictitious one. It's established by uh, the mental acts, what were called cognoscative powers, as they were called in the 17th century. Well, most of this has been forgotten, unfortunately, but there's pretty strong evidence that it's basically correct. And once again, a failure to be puzzled is a serious error. It appears that the elements so fundamental to human language and thought reveal another vast chasm between humans and every other animal. Uh, that poses a huge problem for evolutionary biology comparably huge problem for acquisition of language. Uh, there's interesting experimental evidence that uh, uh, children acquire uh, words like, say, cow or river on as little as a single exposure. You just hear it and they know all the rich meaning. Uh, well, the meaning is somehow coming from the inside without any direct evidence. And it's quite rich, as investigation shows. The what, how, and why questions raised by these systems have only barely been explored, despite their fundamental significance for thought and action. Uh, the origins of the basic elements in their organization uh, remain entirely unknown. And if uh, Richard Lewontin is correct, they may actually remain a permanent uh, mystery for human inquiry. Thanks. Okay, the question is uh, that this contrast between inductivism and deductivism seems to me strongly influenced by Karl Popper. Why? And so my question is... Influenced by what? By Karl Popper. Karl Pop Popper? Yes, oh. the philosopher Karl Popper. And so my question is... <laughs> <laughs> Is, has there been any influence by Popper on your work? <laughs> Popper was just describing what's common sense science since the 17th century. In fact, I would question your first statement. Uh, it's true that I've been involved in a methodological critique since the late 40s, but it's a methodological critique of non-science. Non-science uh, starts with just uh, collecting data and trying to make inductive generalizations from it, and it gets absolutely nowhere. You, know, you just can't do it. It's been understood, in fact, one of the parts of the uh, modern scientific revolution, you know, so-called Galilean revolution, is you don't even try that. Uh, you search, data. that's why scientists do experiments. Uh, in fact, in Galileo's case, kind of thought experiments. Like he didn't drop two balls off the top of the Tower of Pisa, that would never have worked. He just had a very elegant argument, thought argument, that explained why um, a rate of fall wasn't going to affect, uh, be affected by mass. Sometimes he may have done experiments, a lot of them didn't. But the point is, ever since the 17th century, in fact, even before, the scientists inquire of the world. They don't just observe it. They inquire of the world. That's called experiment. They concoct situations that might give you some insight. And from them, they make some guesses about what the theories might be, and then they try other experiments to test the theories. And ultimately, they get sort of back to phenomena, but they really don't care very much if they get back to the phenomena. Because in fact, the phenomena themselves are so complex and so involve so many variables that you just don't try to approximate phenomena. Uh, take the examples that I mentioned. Uh, bee scientists don't try to approximate bees swarming. It's just too complicated. The wind's blowing, you know, one of them changed his mind, whatever. Uh, and f uh, physicists certainly don't, uh, you know, take a look at what's going on outside the window and try to draw inductive generalizations from it. I mean, you go back far enough, and maybe in 
you know, pre-classical Greece, maybe science looked like that. But this is just mythology. It doesn't happen. And it couldn't happen. Scientists are inquiring. They're in inquiring about nature. And the same is true in linguistics. If you're a field worker, so you're working, you know, some unstudied language in the Amazon. I mean, if, if all you can do is take recordings, okay, you take recordings, but you're not going to find much. If you're really doing serious field work, you use the techniques that you learned in your field methods course in college. Namely, you try to figure out the kinds of questions that will elicit data that might be significant and relevant. You just take a look at masses of data, you basically get nothing. It's just noise, you know. So I don't, it's true that it's a methodological critique, but it's a methodological critique of something that dominates in the human sciences, but has absolutely nothing to do with science. That's true of uh, the whole behaviorist tradition. I mean, the idea, or of what was called behavioral science, the 1950s, all the human sciences were called behavioral science. I mean, that makes about as much sense as calling physics meter reading science. I mean, it's true that, you know, take Eddington and others, you can regard physics as in principle just the study of meter readings. But it's not meter reading science. You're using the meter re readings to try and discover something about the world. Well, behavior is just data. Not all the data, incidentally, just some of the data. And selected parts of that data, if you aren't smart enough to figure out which ones, it may tell you something about uh, human capacities and uh, um, the nature of the mind. But uh, just to collect data and uh, you know, uh, organize it somehow is, is going to get you nowhere. Um, if you can't think of anything else to do, you have no ideas, then maybe you do that. But uh, it's not the way science is done. Next question. No. Then go there and then right over there. Ah, so, okay, wait a minute, wait a moment. There's a, the, the, the guy behind and check you. Uh, Professor Jones, would you be so kind as to tell us uh, something more about the third factors uh, you mentioned, so called forms of uh, nature, uh, laws of nature, laws of form, and maybe. Uh, could you mention a couple of authors, one or two possibly, that you found inspirational uh, in finding out about third factors and coming up with that idea? Thank you. Well, the, the, um, the basic third factor properties, uh, back in the 50s and the 60s, uh, they used to be called simplicity. Okay, you want to find the simplest systems. So if there's redundancy in the system, you want to eliminate it. Uh, if there are complicated rules, you want to reduce them to simple rules and so on. Uh, when all of this is rethought in more modern terms, it basically all reduces to the principle of minimal computation. You want computation to be as limited as possible. Now, minimal computation isn't perfectly understood. You know, there are a lot of possible theories of minimal computation. But a lot of aspects of it are pretty well understood. And it is found uh, all over the place in the natural world. And so, for example, to take one surprising and interesting result, uh, there's a tiny animal called the nematodes, uh, the simplest animal that anybody's been able to study. It has 800 cells, uh, 300 neurons, and the neural wiring is completely understood. So you know, you know exactly how they're related. Incidentally, nobody knows why they behave the way they do. You know, the, uh, it's like knowing the genome, but not knowing what organism is going to come out. There's too many other things going on. But uh, the, at least the neural wiring is understood. And there is an uh, interesting study by a scientist at the University of Maryland who's, who has shown that you get exactly that wiring if you assume that the wiring system is minimal in a very specific sense, the sense that's used, that is used by, say, engineers when they're trying to design the simplest transistor, you try to minimize wire length, total wire length, basically, 
And if you do that, you get the wiring system of the nematode. Actually, he argues much beyond that you probably get the wiring system for all organisms. Like one fundamental property of organisms is that the brain is at one end. So, you know, up here, not down here. Uh, and that's true of organisms generally. The, brain, the uh, organisms are kind of long, thin things mostly. Uh, and uh, the brain is at one end, not in the middle. And he gives an interesting argument that that also follows from minimal wiring. Uh, and there are other things in nature that are known to be like that. Well, there's some openness, and there should be, as to what exactly minimal computation is. It's used in computer science all the time, uh, and in biology and elsewhere. And it, some simple ideas carry it pretty far in, uh, in these cases, like the few cases that I mentioned. Uh, all depended on uh, minimal distance. And the question is, what kind of minimal distance? Is it structural or linear? Uh, does it involve missing elements that the mind hears, but the ear doesn't? Uh, or it doesn't, in fact, it does. So that's the kind of principle. As to which authors were, I don't, I don't know what to say. You know, most things you kind of sort of figure out for yourself, and then you're excited to find that somebody else discovered it, you know, and uh, <laughs> go look at that. <laughs> but STF, first you, and yeah, then, then, then we go there. But first you, yeah? What? I guess. What is your opinion on the hypothesis that language as a tool of thought, that is the mechanism that makes thought thought? It's, it's keep, the, keep the micro on to your mouth. Again? Uh, what is your opinion on the hypothesis that as a, um, a tool of thought, language is the mechanism that makes cross-modular thought possible for humans? Uh, that language is a tool of thought and... And makes cross-modular thought possible. I couldn't hear the last oh. part. Um, that without language, there you cannot couldn't be think. Pre no, there just cannot be cross-modular Can thought. Can there be think thought without language? Yes, what's well, your the opinion? The idea that language is a tool of thought, I think, is correct. Now, that's what I had in mind when I said we have to invert Aristotle's dictum. The language is really meaning. Uh, externalization, one way or another, is something secondary. So yes, it's a tool of thought. But once you have this basic compute with this lucky or unlucky person 75,000 years ago, say, who had that mutation and got the minimal computational operation, that person could think. Nobody else could think, at least in the sense that we think with language. They could have complex expressions which mean things and you know, could make up, uh, invent uh, uh, abstract worlds and uh, imagine what would happen in them and so on. That person had a very unusual advantage. Uh, it couldn't communicate with anybody because that was the only person who had it. Uh, mutations occur in an individual, not in a group. So some individual got this capacity for uh, construction of an infinite array of expressions which uh, map on to the thought system. And that person could think for, for, for him or herself uh, using uh, the system. Well, you know, a, a capacity like that can get transmitted to offspring. And if it had some advantage, which it probably did, uh, then that, those offspring might turn out to dominate the society. These are small groups. These are hunter-gatherer groups, very small. Uh, so, you know, over some time, uh, many people might have had the capacity well, at that point, some bright guy might have had the idea of externalizing it. And then what you're thinking, you know, somebody else can figure out too. Probably something like that is the way language evolved. Now, can you have thought without language? It's an unanswerable question because we don't know what we mean by thought. Like, uh, does your dog think, for example? I mean, it certainly does things that look like thinking, but whether they're thinking or not, you know, we don't know because we have no real conception of thought and uh, uh, we don't know what's going on inside the dog. You know? Actually, there's a lot of discussion, those of you in computer science know about this, of whether machines can think. 
and it has an interesting history. It goes back to a paper by the great mathematician Alan Turing uh, back around 1950. He wrote a short paper uh, called Can Machines Think? Some title like that. He was also one of the, the original uh, inventors of the modern computer. He studied it abstractly, but it's the basis for modern computers is his mathematical work and is really one of the outstanding mathematicians. However, uh, and there's a lot of work that's come out of that. Uh, for that example, there's a, there's a competition every year in which you know, smart uh, uh, computer scientists uh, invent program. He, he gave it a test. Nowadays, it's called the Turing test. He called it the imitation game. Uh, he asked, uh, can you construct a program? When people talk about machines, they mean programs. The computer itself is no good for anything except maybe as a paperweight. Uh, but the program in the machine does things. And uh, the idea is to construct a program which can fool a human observer into believing it's a person. That's essentially what it comes down to. And there are competitions every year with huge prizes for the person who does best in this. It's all total nonsense. And t the interesting thing about it is that Turing said so. If you read that eight-page paper, not hard to read, he says the question whether machines think is too meaningless to deserve discussion. Uh, because we have no conception of what thought is. We want to call it thought, okay. It's like asking, uh, the submarine swim? Well, it's, it's not a factual question. It's a question whether you want to extend the metaphor to submarines. Uh, the airplanes fly. In some languages, yes. Other languages, no. It's a question of what metaphor we like. So the, the question is too meaningless to deserve discussion. He nevertheless thought it was a good idea to pursue it because it might encourage people to build better machines. And in fact, that's pretty much what's happened. If you take the things that are famous, you know, like IBM Deep Blue, you know, IBM built some huge complicated machine uh, which plays chess, and at one point it beat the best grand master, and all over the newspapers, machines are smarter than people. It's totally meaningless. It was predictable in advance. I remember discussions about this 60 years ago. It was predictable in advance that sooner or later, you'd be able to program a computer that would uh, beat any chess master. The reason is you've got a big bunch of grand masters sitting around uh, thinking of every possible contingency. It's a finite game, chess. And they'd sooner or later work something out which is better than what a single grand master can do in 45 minutes. So sooner or later, you get a better program. Completely meaningless, except maybe for selling machines. And that's actually what IBM uses it for. It uses it for propaganda. Uh, recently, there was another case that hit the newspapers. I don't know if it did here, about some the story. What there's some game that they play on television. It's called Jeopardy. You know, people make guesses about things, and they designed the machine that beat the best humans in Jeopardy. And again, total triviality. You learn absolutely nothing from it. Uh, it's, uh, you don't know anything about humans, you don't know anything about thought. All you know is if you work hard enough, you can get a program that will do complicated things. Uh, meaningless. So, and the same problem arises about whether animals think or whether, say, a two-day-old infant thinks. It's doing things that look rational and so on, but whether that's thought or not is kind of like asking whether submarines swim. If you want to call it swimming, they do. If you don't want to call it swimming, they don't. You know? But it, it's not a, it's just like Turing said, it's not a real question. So, Sie, haben Sie ein Mikrofon? Hat? Here we have two questions. Good. Yeah. Okay, then, then first start there, and then you are the next. Yeah, because uh, we are closer. You then hear the question, then you, and then we are a little bit coming to an end, I guess, so here. Two questions uh, about WH questions. Um, in the sentence, who did John see? Uh, who has two roles? One indicated by its original position in the object position, 
and the other one at the front of the sentence uh, indicating uh, its role as WH operator. What about uh, languages such as Chinese, where you have such Yuan as, Saw Hu? Such as what? Such Chinese. as Chinese. Chinese, with, yeah. Without WH yeah. movement, visible yeah. WH movement. Well, that's uh, an, yeah. Yes, that would, no, that's the first question. Second question, you also have so-called uh, long-distance WH questions, like uh, who did you say Bill thought Hans saw? Yeah. And there is good evidence uh, that the movement to the front of the sentence in these cases is piecemeal, stepwise. Yeah. Are there additional semantic roles in these intermediate steps? So these would be the two questions. Well, that's, uh, the second question is tricky. Uh, there is very good evidence that it's piecemeal, and that incidentally is another application of minimal uh, computation. The computation is simpler if it goes in small steps, if it's broken up into small steps. And there is pretty good empirical evidence, it's been around for about 40, 40 years or so, that in fact it is in small steps. That raises the question whether the, the second question you asked, uh, whether these uh, intermediate steps have interpretations. That's pretty hard to tease out. Uh, these, these are questions of what's called reconstruction. Uh, they're quite difficult questions. They get into subtle considerations of a variable binding, like can you move a WH over a quantifier and have it still be interpreted, but not under that quantifier. Now, these get you into sentences that are quite subtle and complex. Now, the fact of the matter seems to be is that by and large, they don't, uh, except maybe in pretty subtle cases, the intermediate positions don't seem to have uh, uh, interpretations. There's arguments to the contrary. Uh, Julie Legate is one person who's found interesting evidence that in some cases they do get interpretations. Uh, but, uh, and that does raise an interesting question, why doesn't that happen? I think there's some answers to it. Uh, the answers to it have to do with, uh, this is something I really can't go in into here, but if you look at, it's what's called the theory of projection. So if you go back to say, for, for, you're obviously no linguistics, so you'll understand. Uh, you go back to phrase structure grammar, you know, back um, 50 years ago. Uh, every category had uh, projected to something. X bar theory, it becomes explicit. So, you know, read books becomes, is identified as a verb phrase, not a noun phrase. Okay, it's traditional grammar. That means that the verb projects, but the noun doesn't. And it was assumed in those theories that everything has a projection. Uh, modern terminology is a label. Everything has a label. That's probably wrong. It's probably the case that, on, that the only things that are labeled are those that enter into further computation, because that's the only role of the label. The role of the label is to tell the generative system what kind of an object are you. And if you don't have a label, if you don't enter into computation, you don't want to know that. Now, successive cyclic movement, the kind you're talking about, uh, the intermediate positions don't have labels. There's very good reasons to think that they don't have labels because of the simplest way of producing labels. And that's the right result. That means that they must move on and they won't get an interpretation, which seems to be the overwhelmingly true conclusion. So it, 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 did, it did raise questions. The question you raise is a very serious one. It's been around for a long time. But there's probably an answer for it, again, in terms of minimal communication. This incidentally isn't in print, but there's, you know, there's work on this. I've given a number of talks about it. Uh, the first question about Chinese and similar languages that have uh, what's called WH and C2, that is the WH phrase, only has, it only appears in one position, the position where it gets its semantic role. Uh, those have been studied extensively since work by uh, Jim Huang back around 1980, 
Uh, he argued and gave interesting evidence that even in, in Chinese, his native language, uh, even if uh, you, though you don't hear the thing move, uh, it's mentally moving. It's what's called covered movement. It's moving but doesn't leave uh, visual, you know, audible evidence that it's moving. And the, his basic argument was that Chinese questions have essentially the same properties as uh, English or German-like questions where the thing actually moves. And those properties can be explained in terms of the successive cyclic movement. So it therefore looks as though it's successively cyclically moving in Chinese. Now since then there's other work by Tanya Reinhardt and Dylan Tsai and others with a different approach saying that in Chinese type languages there's actually an operator high up uh, which is seeking the WH phrase by you know, ordinary you know, matching operations, GRI it's called, and it's, uh, it has a special semantic function which yields the interpretation of the question. So there's these two competing theories around pretty much about uh, whether there's actual movement or uh, an operator that it gives slightly different interpretations than actual movement. But that's uh, uh, normal, you know. Uh, when you make a generalization in the natural sciences, uh, usually it's not true. Uh, there, you find exceptions. You find exceptions because the world's more complicated. Uh, so for, uh, but in the natural science, here's a difference in methodology, in the approach to the human sciences and the natural sciences. In the human sciences, when people find ex apparent exceptions to a generalization, they say, okay, we throw out the generalization. There's nothing there. Anything can happen, you know. And there's plenty of current papers that draw that conclusion. That's, exact, that's not at all the way you work in the natural sciences. So, for example, it was discovered, you know, many years ago that uh, Neptune, the planet Neptune, does not have the expected elliptical orbit. It's, there's perturbations in the orbit. Well, if you treated it the way people treat linguistics, you would have said, okay, let's throw out Kepler's and Newton's laws. I got a counterexample. Uh, nobody did that. What people did was start, try to figure out why there's, it's not working that way. Well, finally, they discovered Pluto. Okay, it turned out it's, now it's working the way it's supposed to. Uh, that's the way all of natural science works at least since the 17th century, probably long before. Uh, but uh, in the human sciences, there's just a different attitude towards it. Uh, if a, a apparent generalization doesn't seem to work, you throw out everything. And you say, okay, everything goes. You're back to the non-existence approach. It's a very strange way in which we study our own minds, you know, not using the approaches of the sciences. It's kind of like the behaviorism case. Sie, Sie, ja, ja. Ähm, weiter gleich. Hallo. Um, first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm not a linguist, so uh, excuse my question. You've talked about reversing the dictum of Aristotle, and uh, I would like to know um, whether you believe that language can express through structure more than the meaning of its words. For instance, in poetry, where we have repetition to express beauty or desire. Um, could you comment on that, please? Yeah. See, that's a, yeah, that certainly is true. And actually, that's an observation, which I don't know how far, in a way, it goes back to Plato, I guess. But it, it was expressed in kind of modern terms by a Spanish uh, philosopher, linguist in the 16th century, Juan Huarte, he uh, described what he called three kinds of intelligence, three levels of intelligence. Uh, the lowest level is uh, animals. They're kind of like reflex machines. The middle level is uh, humans. They can create new expressions, new thoughts. He couldn't say how, you know, it's too early for that, but he kind of recognize that there's some creative aspect to normal language use. And then he said there's a third category, what you're talking about, uh, the poetic use of language or uh, the arts. And here he followed Plato. He said there's a mixture of madness in that. 
but it's some new kind of, it's a higher kind of uh, uh, use of language than the normal creative use. And yeah, sure, that's some, something like that's obviously true. You know. um, true creativity, re what we call creative acts, are different than the innovative acts that we carry out all the time. What, what that difference is, it's what uh, a 